<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, many years ago, my husband and I and our two little preschoolers, we were living in Topeka, Kansas. And our state coordinator came to us one day and said, uh, we need someone in this other town called Hutchinson, Kansas. The leader's leaving. And he said, how do I put this? Well, it, it's had some problems this year. And I mean, it's due to the leader. And he said, I just feel in my heart that you and Mike, as he was talking to me, that you're the ones that need to go there and heal everything up. Since Mike and I first got married, we both knew we were pastors. And pastors take care of the flock, don't they? They mend their hurts. And I really believe in my heart that after anyone gets born again, Romans 10, 9, and 10, you are already pastoring people to get in the word, to under shepherd them. We're all like shepherds because we help others grow in the body. We give, they give to us. It's just, I think we're just almost all like pastors of God's people after we get born again. And our theme verse is Galatians 2, 6. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We went to Hutchinson. And the first meeting my husband had was a big meeting. We had like, there was like six fellowships in house. We got them all in our big old house where we were renting. And Mike taught so beautifully that night. And afterwards, I just, I watched people because I didn't know only you know, one or two people from that area. So I just watched people. And each time we had a meeting, I would watch people again to get to know people, watch who kind of stuck together and hung out together. I noticed this one young lady was, would stand in a group of ladies talking after a meeting, but she never said anything. Sometimes I even see her sitting by herself, sitting with nobody else. So one day I um, got a hold of another believer. I said, let's go to the restaurant where Patty works and get a cup of coffee just to bless her, just to show up, ask to be in her section. So we did, and that hostess took us over to Patty's section, and she didn't tell Patty there wasn't anybody there for her. So Patty walks out, and she's just like, what are you two doing here? And I said, well, we just thought we'd go out for coffee this morning, and we knew we had to come here because we wanted to see you. And she just went, what? I said, yeah. We were only there in Hutchinson for one year. But God laid it onto my heart that I had to spend time with Patty that year. I would call her up and say, you want to just go window shopping? I ain't got no money to spend, but let's just go window shopping. She, oh, yeah, let's go window shopping. Let's go have coffee. Let's just go out for a walk in the park. And we just talk the word. And the day we packed up to move. I said, Mike, I got to go say goodbye to Patty personally. And I'd already said goodbye to her at the last meeting. We got there. And we talked for a few minutes. And as we were getting ready to leave, she came up and put her arms around me and whispered in my ear, no one's ever loved me or taken care of me the way you have this year. It's just changed my life. And I got in the car, I said, thank you, God, that I listened to you when I first got here and you pointed her out to me. And, you know, we stayed in contact for a while. And we, then we lost contact. We, we all moved away and this and that. But she comes to my mind many times. And I think of her and I pray for her. I know I'll be in eternity with her. And that's like the song I sang yesterday. Is there anybody out there hurting sitting right next to you? There's a story in the, in the Bible that, God, that Jesus Christ told to the leaders, those wonderful leaders that detested him, tried to catch him in any little thing. And he told them the story about the Good Samaritan. The title of my teaching today is You Can Be the Next Good Samaritan. Now there's 
a goal set down at your feet. And he talked about this man that was journeying. He was journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he was attacked. In our country, you use the word, uh, they, you get mugged, okay? That's, that's a, the term we use. They beat him up. They robbed him. They took his clothes, took everything from him, and left him practically beaten to death along the side of the road. The first person that came upon him was a Pharisee. Now, you know Jesus is talking to the Pharisees right now, so now we know this is the leaders. And the Pharisee took one look at him and went, oh, I don't think so. So he walked around on the other side of the road and walked on the other side, away from him. Next came a Levite. In many of the, the translations, they say it's a lawyer. Can never trust the lawyers. <laughs> and he saw him. And he walked around on the other side. And a little later, a Samaritan came by. Now, the reason the Jews did not like the Samaritans and were told not to fellowship or have anything to do with the Samaritans, because when the Judeans, when Judah and Israel were carried away into bondage, some of the Jews stayed back in Samaria, intermarried with Gentiles. So they were unclean and they were not supposed to associate with them. But the man, the Samaritan, was a goodwill neighbor, wasn't he? Even though he looked so bad, that man laying there, he took care of him. He cleaned him up. He bound his wounds, put him on his own donkey, took him to an inn, paid to have that man stay there and told the innkeeper, if he spends any more money when I come back through, I will pay you what, he, what, what, you, what I owe you for him. I'm sure he changed that man's life from that point on, did he not? There's many different undercurrents through this whole story so many it's to leaders it's kind of an example of what the religious jews did to jesus christ they gave him over to the gentile soldiers and let him get beaten to heck there's a lot of different undercurrents look at this record sometimes you'll see them Turn to Ephesians 5, 1 to 2, please. We're going to cover a verse that is kind of tells us very similar, okay, to what Galatians tells us. Ephesians is a book that teaches us the doctrine. A couple of years ago at Weekend of the Word, I told everyone we, that Ephesians is the book of champions. If you want to be a champion, you dig into the book of Ephesians. It'll change your life. Ephesians 5, verse 1 says, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. The Good Samaritan took his time to take care of someone. And that's the privilege that we get to do. Just like Jesus took the disciples under his wing and taught them so they could go and teach others. We are to walk in love as dear children of God. Imitate God. Well, God is all what? Love. So that's our example. Jesus Christ accomplished what he did because his love for God and he obeyed God. Jesus Christ being our, our, he was our example. Jesus Christ was the word in flesh. So in the gospels, people saw the love of God in him. He encouraged his disciples to walk as he had walked. Jesus walked in love, the complete opposite of the religious leaders at that time. They were not caring or loving. All they did was write more laws to the people to live by. And we at one time were with a ministry, some of us, that just kept adding more and more rules and regulations on us and lost the love of God. And stopped putting Jesus Christ as the head and the Lord of their lives. And that's the key. And Charlie's sh shared on that. The key to staying locked in in our lives as we continue to keep but the Lord Jesus Christ, number one in our lives, our pattern is him. 
He's the archetype. He's our leader, the head of our church. And we're right underneath him, baby. Right underneath him. There's nobody else between us and Jesus Christ. Our yearly topic has been the fruit of the spirit. And as we walk by the spirit, we will manifest the fruit of the spirit. And God is always there every minute, every second for you. For you to walk spiritually with him. He will never leave you hang. Or needing or wanting that next direction to go. Never will he leave you hang. A couple of years ago, I had just gotten home from Tucson, Arizona, and I got a call from our wonderful Charlie Quillen. It was Friday. He said, you having fellowship this Sunday? I said, oh, yeah. He goes, well, I just wanted to give you a heads up. You may have a few more people that are going to come to your fellowship this Sunday. I said, well, how many people are we looking at? Because, well, you could have maybe 20, 30 people showing up. <laughs> Are you kidding me? He goes, no. He said, there's some believers in Grace Lake that have decided that they are going to leave the group they're with and they want to come to your fellowship this Sunday. Now, Mike's out of town. He's in Kansas. Oh, no. I'm by myself. I said, whatever needs to be done. He said, I knew you'd say that. Yes. So immediately, you know, when I start putting teaching together, this is how I do it. I said, okay, God, you know the theme, you know, if, if I don't know the subject, I said, you, you know the subject, I'm supposed to teach. And I just start praying about it. And sometimes I start getting little bits and pieces, you know, just a verse will come or whatever. So I get up Sunday morning, I've got nothing yet. I got, I got nothing, okay. And I keep going, okay, uh, okay. Uh, um. And then all of a sudden, what pops in my mind is the Good Samaritan. So I got this guy. I got this. I've read it numerous times. It's one of my favorites record. I've taught it. Just tell me where to go with it. So I sat down. I read through the verses and said, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And there was nothing there. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there. And 1030 is fellowship. This is like seven in the morning. I'm like, and I got to get lunch ready. I got to do some children's fellowship. I got the flowers together. Like, okay, God. Okay, God. So I just keep praying. And again, it just, the thought is the good Samaritan. I said, okay, well, that's what I'm supposed to teach. I'm supposed to, that's what I'm going to teach. And uh, the last thing I said before I went up to get a shower, I said, okay, well, then just when I do this record today, God, you're just going to have to tell me what else I need to do. Down through the years, it's just been a couple of phrases that God has said to me when I'm waiting for him to tell me something. One is, three little words, wait and see. <laughs> and the other one was, just let it flow. And that day he told me both of them and I went, okay, I'm winging it. And I know you're going to be there because you're never late. They all came in. Okay, we're singing songs in English and Spanish, and the Spanish people are singing a lot louder than we are. Okay, and so I'm trying to lead songs. It's like, oh God, help me! Please, somebody. I've never done this before. Okay, <laughs> so I sit down to teach the Good Samaritan. I think it was Nellie or Isabel were back. They didn't have the headsets, so they were back there translating. I get through that whole record and teach it. And I'm waiting for God to tell me, where am I going? <laughs> wait, you see, I wait, I wait, I wait. And all of a sudden he just says, offer ministry and healing. I went, oh, got it. And when I said, would anyone like to minister to? And I think almost every single person in that back row of the Hispanics raised their hand. I grabbed two people for each one we ministered to from our fellowship and an interpreter. And we went from one, one after the other, after the other. After. And when they came in, I was like me in my backpack last night. They walked in my door like this. 
And when they walked out, their shoulders were back and they were smiling big and tall. Okay. That's what they needed. Just as needed to hear the word and someone to minister to them and love them because they hadn't been getting that love in the heart of God. That's what we get to do. That's our privilege after we get born again. In Colossians, it's Christ in you. Wherever you go, they look in your eyes and see Christ. Whenever you touch them, you're touching them with the hand of God. God in Christ in you. When God formed and made this world, the perfect plan that he had, you were in it. From day one, you were in the perfect plan, which is the church of God. Jesus Christ dying, raising, being raised from the dead, ascending on high, and the church of God. To show people the love and the power that God has for his people. And he's willing to give it to every man, woman, and child on the earth. And it comes from you and me. And if it doesn't come from us, they're wandering aimlessly, aren't they? And we've got all we need right here. And the spirit that God has given us to walk with him. And not be afraid that he's not going to be there for you every single second and minute of the day. Because he is, isn't he? Yes. We're to encourage each other by God's word that lives in our hearts. Does it live in your heart? Yes. And people will see it even when you just walk down the street. When you're at the grocery store and you just smile at somebody, they're seeing Christ and sometimes they have no idea that's who they're looking at. That's who they're looking at. I was at the grocery store one time. I was checking out and the lady that was checking me out, I'd never seen her at the store. I go to the same stores. Never seen her there checking out. And she just didn't look good. And I said, are you okay? She goes, oh, I'm having a really rough day today. It's been hard. And I looked at her and I said, well, from the time you just said that, I'm going to be praying for you today. So the steak gets better for you. And she said, it already started. Oh. Isn't that wonderful? She said, it already started right now. We just don't know sometimes what we do for people with just a smile or a kind word. No wonder people flocked behind Jesus Christ as he walked down the road. <laughs> we practice daily encouragement in truth. We learn to default to confidence in Christ instead of unbelief and desperation from our feelings. Did you catch what I just said? <laughs> we practice daily encouragement in truth. We learn to default to confidence in Christ instead of unbelief and desperation of our feelings or in desperation of trying to do it on our own. Feelings come and go, but God's word liveth and abideth forever. We need one another to be steadfast. I need you so I can be steadfast on the word. You need me. You need everyone in this room and every other believer that you come in contact with. I started working as a temporary secretary years ago. Met a lady, Christian, Roman Catholic, loved God, loved his word. We just got closer and closer and we were, we'd see each other and became friends. And I had just been kicked out of a ministry that didn't love me anymore. I had no friends. I really didn't. I had no friends. All my friends were in the church. And we went out to lunch one day. And as we're walking out, Jean turns to me. She goes, oh, God gave you to me. And I grabbed her hand and I looked at her and said, no, God gave you to me. There's Christians out there everywhere that just need to be loved and taken care of. And we have the heart to do it. And sometimes they're in churches that there's just not that heart there, okay? And they need us when they see us in the world. And Jesus Christ, you know, when he um, was the perfect sacrifice, the last Passover, 
you know, in the temple, they used to burn uh, all these, in the incense and all these wonderful smells. Oh my gosh, they were fantastic. And the odor would just permeate throughout the whole tabernacle and it would even float out to the Gentiles where they were at and the women, okay, they could smell. And everyone would kind of go home with those smells on their bodies and stuff and they would burn stuff in their homes. And the reason the incense and all those things were started in the tabernacle by God was because he wanted them to remember the things that he had made for them so they could smell those wonderful smells. And whenever they would smell them, they would think of God. Well, it says in God's word that we are the sweet smelling savor to God. And we are the sweet smelling savior to the world. The savor that they smell and see and touch. Like so many in the world are not like us, are they? They bite and devour each other. Climb the ladder of success and still not satisfied. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of women are today in our world, in our country. Very educated, vice presidents, directors, still trying to have kids, trying to be a wife. And they said, oh, I've done all these things, but I'm not fulfilled because they have not Christ. And we get to tell them, you can have a lot more than what you thought you were going to get. We love our sisters and brothers so much that we watch with Christ's eyes and listen with our spiritual ears. So we're ready to see a need in a believer. We are to give live and love with Christ's heart in God's word. And I'm going to give you a few verses in Romans if you want to write them down. These are just a few that help us in our walk. Romans 8:26 says, "The spirit helps in our weakness." Do you ever feel weak spiritually? I've been there. That morning I got up and I wasn't sure what I was teaching on. I was kind of was getting a little weak and anxious. And I kept going over that, those verses in Philippians. Be not anxious. Be not anxious. God's never, God's never been late for you before. He's not going to be late this time. Two, God has a plan. Romans 28 says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose that is a tremendous verse that one's just blows my mind every time i read it god works all good things for you every minute every second every hour of every day without fail because it loves you so much and you're his kid <laughs> Romans 8 31 there is no there is nothing and no one to fear if God is for us what who can be against us for we are already overcomers Romans 8 37 nay in all these things we are what more than conquerors through him who loved us that's why we're more than conquerors, because God loves us. Oh, it's so easy. Children want to do what their parents ask them to do because they love mom and dad. And they know mom and dad love them. We're just the same imitators, right, as children. Uh, the next one is nothing can separate you from God. Romans 8, 38, and 39. Nothing can separate you. Nothing can separate me. No matter what you're involved in in the world that is negative or hurting, nothing can separate you from God as you're dealing with it. And we've all dealt with difficulty in our lives, have we not? Some of the teenage girls have told me they've had to deal with bullying in school when they're 12, 13, 14 years old. I don't even know if I dealt with bullying when I was in high school that old. It just didn't happen that much back then. It happens more and more all the time. And they've shared that with me. And I'm glad you have because then I get to pray for you. But they said, God came through. I got you. Know, God just, he took care of me. God's love, his word and spirit and his spirit inside enables us to walk holy and acceptable. Just as Christ was on this earth. 
As we walk by the Spirit with love, we are able to minister to others just like the Lord. Do you know that people lived under the law for so many centuries? Christ came and he got rid of the law. And you know, it says there are no laws for us. In the church of God, there are no laws. Yeah, we still keep the commandments because we're walking by the spirit, but we have no laws. If there was a law, if there was a law, it'd be the law of love, but it's not a law. But if there was a law, that would be the law for us. I know. So we do everything with the love of God in the renewed mind and manifestation. Cool. Take your Bibles, turn to Proverbs 16, 24. I'm going to finish with this verse. And I got another story. You know, I always have lots of stories. I was in the grocery store again. <laughs> I was getting ready to check out. And there was this older woman with her granddaughter in front of me. And she turns to her granddaughter with a gallon of milk. And she says, you're going to have to take this gallon of milk back and put it in the, in the refrigerator. Grandpa forgot to give me enough money. And the thought came to me, buy the milk. I said, I'll buy your milk. Oh, no, I can't let you do that. I, no, I'm sorry, but I kept saying, I, I kept telling her, I'll do it. No. And I said, God wants me to bless you. I'm buying your milk. And she said, oh, you're a believer. I'll let you buy my own my milk. Because yeah. she knew I wanted to give. She goes, you're a believer. I mean, she was just thrilled. And as she got checked out and I was ready right after her to check out, she turned around, and walked out and she goes, I'm going to pray for you. I said, I'll pray for you. And when I got in the car, now this is how God gets so deep down. Oh, I get in the car and I'm just feeling so good. Said, oh, thanks God for doing that for me. I got so blessed and she got blessed. And all of a sudden the words in my mind came, pray for her heart. I got in my car, I said, okay, God. I just thank you, whatever's on her heart, that you take care of all these things and whatever burdens she has. And all of a sudden, God interrupted me and said, her real heart. <laughs> I went, oh my God. And I ministered to her heart in the car with what God told me was going on in her physical heart. I never, ever had anything like that happening in my life. It was just blew me away. To be at the right place at the right time. So cool. And that's what this next verse is about. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones and healing to the heart, the mind, everything. The words of our God are just wonderful words that we get to speak and live every day as Christian women. Isn't that wonderful? And today I would like to end with a poem written by a wonderful believer in Maine, Mars Coleman. I'm blessed because I walk with God. The gospel of peace on my feet are shod. I hold fast within my heart the word of God that will not depart. I live to serve and love to man every day with all that I am. I'll serve my God with my all in all and continue to answer his loving call. I'll seek to heal and set captives free with the commission Christ gave to me. Christ strengthens me in the inner man to do all things that he says I can. I've seen God's grace in my life to be true and his grace can abound in your life too. Let God's word rule firm in your heart. There the road of grace and peace will start. Father, I thank you so very much for this day, for your how your word just reaches right out and grabs on our hearts and our minds, our thoughts, and just massages the hurt and the worry and the anxiousness and fear away. Thank you for strengthening us like you always say in manifestations. If you're there, it's giving us, making us strong. Thanks too, Father, we have the body of Christ to lean on. We get to lean on the body of Christ like we lean on you, like we lean on the power that's in us as Christ in us. And Father, we thank you for the many, how many days we have left here on earth. 
And if the Lord should tarry, we just thank you for these wonderful younger women in this ministry that they carry on and hold the word of truth high with all the love in their hearts from you. And we thank you for all these things, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.